what's good world the people in the universe it's all good it's a voice here back at you again with another fasting video with a new setup new software and a new outlook on life yes doing reviews on fasting yes 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 it's finally here but i really i've been really aiming to do have my life broadcasted as a fasting <laughs> and then getting the information out there about fasting and here we have it dr andrew huberman from huberman labs this is podcast on youtube i've been watching it this whole year even before he started his podcast i was following him because he was an advocate for getting information out to the public about the body and the mind and how it operates together he has a whole series of different stuff he covers from the brain to sleeping to sunlight to a whole lot of stuff that's informational based towards humans and what you can do to improve your health and life in this video on episode 41 of his podcast he talks about the effects of time restricted eating and fasting it's one of the dopest videos he has one of my favorite videos and he explains a lot of the benefits about fasting now, he doesn't really talk about fasting. He talks about time-restricted eating in an eight-hour window and less. And he explains the pros and the cons of it. And then he explains the pros and the cons of going outside of an eight-hour eating window. And everything is pretty much what I agree upon, except some of the fasting mimicking techniques that he go over, which I explain why I don't like and why I don't do stuff like that. And he explains on other other with other information on why they aren't that necessary but this video is very detailed and he keep it simple and i help with my input on it on my end about what i do when i come across certain situations what he talk about and how he explains it but um, and the big thing is he's talking about fasting and the benefits of it and he's excited about the research and he gets me excited as somebody that's excited to help other people and then on top of that I was so excited to do this myself uh, I kind of jumped right into it right after I got the software set up I had all my liking I had some things to twitch and next thing you know I was completely doing the video and sorry if I wasn't looking presentable with my hair and how tired I was but I was excited about doing a video. The information is still raw. It's still, it's still on top of my game about getting the information out there to you guys. And I promise it's still good. And so never mind me looking a hot mess. Uh, cleaned up now. But throughout the video, you see in the background, like the sun comes up. And I was working on this in the early morning all the way throughout the day trying to get the whole setup right. So this is my first setup time doing this review type style of of a scientist talking about fasting and i'm going to be doing this from here on out and his one of his first videos on exactly fasting and time restricted eating and the effects on your health it has for you so hope you guys enjoy the video make sure you like subscribe and share like i said always is always for love and trying to get the information out there to help you guys and uh, you know we can be on a higher level with this and it's all love baby peace okay, so let's talk about feeding fasting health and performance yes yes right, let's get into it a few foundational terms so that we're all on the same page first of all rather than or time restricted feeding i'm largely going to talk about time restricted feeding yes please understand that time restricted feeding is just one side of the coin that is a two-sided coin that includes fasting, fasting. on one hand yes. not eating and time restricted feeding on the other hand I may occasionally say fasting, but okay. My difference between the two is time restricted. Time restricted eating is when you pick certain times to eat. And you usually stay. You usually stay on a routine. I really don't do that. I really, I don't really see a pattern to follow with food like that, unless it's in season or not. Season is. is spring summer fall winter not in regards to everyday eating just because you don't want to get your body too familiar with anything time it gets too familiar that's when it gets comfortable we strive better in struggle times 
So time restricting eating a little bit more softer in my eyes. Fasting periodically, meaning I break my fast here or there or here or there. And it's not really in a thought. It's just you go in these certain periods like, oh, 16 hours is fast. Should I eat now? Oh, I'm going to keep going. Or it's 20 hours or it's been a day. Should I eat? Do I have the time to do it? Am I going to be stressed eating? So time restricted eating, you make time for it. Regular fasting, you really don't make time for it. So that's the difference in my eyes. Because fasting and eating establish different biological conditions in the body, time restricted feeding is the term that I will use to describe the overall plan of restricting one's eating window, as it's called, to a particular phase of each 24 hour day, or in some cases, to particular days within the week. Because as you'll soon learn, there are aspects of time restricted feeding fasting that involve eating every other day yes alternate day fasting one way for five days and then fasting for two days and so forth yeah, five so two you can do five days of fasting two days eating or two days of fasting five the days of being, eating you can go either or eating as a way to put an umbrella over this conversation second of all i am going to emphasize a lot of biological mechanism if you've listened to this podcast before you know that I always begin with biological mechanism. I do describe tools of how to implement those mechanisms, but I wholeheartedly believe that knowing mechanisms and understanding how these processes work yes. gives you tremendous flexibility and understanding and control over the processes of your mental and physical health. Exactly. You understanding the information how your body works and the information you put in your body is the best mental health and physical health you can get for yourself rather than relying on other people than with the sources. Whereas if I were to just list off a menu of things to do and not to do, those will work, but those will not give you the kind of understanding that would allow you to navigate through life, through travel, through dinners out, through different exercise schedules, whether or not you're one age or another age, male, female, etc. I'm giving you mechanisms so that you can gain more control over the systems in your brain and body. Exactly. Everything's time stamped. Put so the power you in your hands. To-dos, you can certainly do that, but I encourage you to hang in there for the mechanism bit. I will make it all very clear because if you understand mechanism, you are in a true place of power and control over your biology. Hear that? true control over your biology when you understand the mechanism that's going in your body and how your body operates with these mechanisms is can be very complex but there is a simpler form you got to realize our bodies are very simple but very very complex at the same time and we can't understand that it's your body you can feel it you can sense it you just got to clean it up you got to put your health before your liking then we can move forward If ever there was a topic that is controversial, especially on the internet, it is that of diet and nutrition. So I'm wading into this with a smile and in eager anticipation of all the but, but, but this and but, but that and wait, but this showed that. Here's the deal. We need to precisely define what it is that we're talking about when we talk about nutrition. I'm going to give you an example of a study that was published a few years ago, 2018, by a colleague of mine at Stanford, Chris Gardner. This paper, where Chris is the first author, it's Gardner et al., 2018, JAMA, looked at weight loss in people following one particular diet versus another particular diet. This was a 12-month weight loss study, so it was focused specifically on weight loss, although they looked at some other parameters as well. And study from Gardner and colleagues is a beautiful study and really emphasizes that if one's main goal is simply to lose weight, then it really does not matter what one eats, provided that the number of calories burned is higher than the number of calories ingested. That's simple math. If you want to lose weight, you have to first think about, yo, are you... You don't need to be counting calories. You just need to be burning more than you intake if you want to lose weight. 
Some people, they just want shortcuts. Shortcuts. You want to lose the weight, you got to have a draw a line in the sand. Understand like, yo, if I put more weight on, I'm going to have to work harder to get it off. Plain and simple. If you don't want to carry your underweight, you, you don't eat as much and you burn more of the weight off. You know what I mean? Putting the weight back on, just putting the weight back on instead of cutting a little bit off every single day and working harder. Simple. Like, weight loss shouldn't be determined by your intake and outtake. It should be determined by how much you work for the burn off the fat. Plain, plain and simple. Like, you burn it off and don't re ingest. And that's when fasting comes along. If you keep that weight off, people don't understand that. You can keep it off. You got to stay disciplined. Understand, like, yo, are you food addicted? Are you working out just so you can be a fat ass or you working out so you can look good plain and simple however anyone out there who understands a little bit of biology or a lot of biology will agree that there are many factors that impact that calories burn part of the equation some of those are obvious so for instance amount of exercise type of exercise basal metabolic rate how much energy one burns just sitting there. I've talked before on this podcast about NEAT, non-exercise induced thermogenesis, where if people bounce around a lot and fidget a lot, they can burn anywhere from 800 to 2000 calories per day. So their quote unquote basal metabolic rate is actually much higher simply because they're fidgeters. Whereas people who tend to be more stationary have a lower basal metabolic rate on average. It's great science. Understanding your body and how to work it. Um, I'm a kind of in between. I fidget sometimes, and sometimes I very I don't move. I'm very still. I'm very calm. So, like a fidgeter type of person, just like he said, you can burn 500 to 2,000 calories just being a fidgeter, just being shaky, 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 moving, moving, moving. You always wanting to go compared to the person that's not. Yeah, you, know, you got to work harder when it's time for you to exercise. So you got some people that don't need to really exercise a whole lot because they're fidgeters. They're they're active people. They're always up, down, up, down, moving nonstop. And you got other people that are standstill type people, which is okay. But you got to understand you got to work harder when it's time to move, when it's time to be active. When it's time to go for that walk, you need to be going hard that whole walk or that whole run or whole time at the gym. Compared to a person like me that's a fidgeter, um, I'm up at 4.30 and then I'm going, going, going until I'm down. You know, I mean, until it's time to relax, then I'm going, 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 and it's time to relax. That's how most fidgeters are. That's how I am, and trust me, just being me, I can burn up to almost 2,000 calories just not even eating the gym. I'm that type of person. I got an active lifestyle. I got kids and animals and everything. That's why fasting on top of being a fidgeter, I burn natural calories, taking care of myself and my family. I burn my natural calories. I don't have to really worry about a gym I just got to worry about my intake. And that's when fasting comes along with me and having a family. So about your intake and what you put in your body, how your body operate off this energy. But today we're going to be very precise about how time-restricted feeding, it's very clear from both animal studies and human studies, can have a very powerful and positive impact on everything from weight loss and fat loss to various health parameters. This is a beautiful literature that's emerged mostly in the last 10 or 15 years. And as we march into this literature, what you'll see is that there actually is a perfect diet for you on a given day. And that perfect diet for you on a given day mm. is contextual, yes. meaning it depends on what you did yesterday and what you're going to do tomorrow. Exactly. So there is a perfect diet for you. And that's exactly why. Like everybody should understand information about fasting and, and getting together a plan where if it's your lifestyle, you you figuring out like what day should I eat depending on what I got to do this week rather than the next day. You don't get energy from the food you eat the same day. Okay, people go on water fasts for two, three days and get more done than they do in a whole week with eating in between. Why is that? What is your body storing fat for if you're never going to burn it? You're storing fat every day, you're storing fat and never burning that amount. You, you, you really eat. That's why it comes to balance. 
we talked about it, it, it comes down in the middle of balance in between knowing like your calorie intake and your what you burn. So let's talk about eating and what happens when you eat and let's talk about fasting or not eating and what happens when you fast. I did an entire episode on eating and metabolism and hormones and other factors that impact appetite. We don't have time to go into all those details now, although you're welcome to listen to that no, episode as well. That's what he talks about. But we can briefly describe the overall conditions that are set in the body when we eat and when we don't eat. The key word here is conditions. If I can emphasize anything today, it's that what you eat and when you eat it set conditions in your body. And those conditions can be very good for you or very bad for you, depending on when you eat. In fact, when you eat is as important as what you eat. I'll repeat that. When you eat is as important as what you eat, at least as it relates to health parameters, in particular liver health and mental health. Some simple rules about eating. First of all, when you eat, Typically, your blood glucose, your blood sugar will go up. That's what breaks up. Also, balance. insulin levels will go up. Insulin is a hormone that's involved in mobilizing glucose from the bloodstream. Then that's a calorie how much you your glucose spike. and insulin go up depends on what you eat and how much you eat. In general, simple sugars, including fructose from fruit, but also sucrose and glucose, and simple sugars will raise your insulin and blood glucose more than complex carbohydrates, things like grains and breads and pastas and so forth. And grains and breads and pastas and so forth will raise your blood glucose more than fibrous carbohydrates like lettuce and broccoli and things of that sort. Protein has a somewhat moderate or modest impact on insulin and glucose, and fat has the lowest impact on raising your blood glucose and blood insulin. So what you eat will impact how steep a rise in blood glucose and insulin takes place and there are a number of factors that are related to your individual health that will also dictate how steep and how high that rise in glucose and insulin will be for the time being i'm leaving out people who have type 1 diabetes these are people that don't manufacture their own insulin and type 2 diabetes is essentially insulin insensitivity lack of sensitivity to insulin which leads to high blood glucose but when you eat blood glucose goes up and when you don't eat blood glucose and insulin go down the longer it's been since your last meal the lower typically your blood glucose and insulin that's kind of a fire hose of information about what happens when you eat and don't eat but just think of it this way blood sugar and insulin go up when you eat They go down when you don't eat, and other hormones go up when you don't eat. So there are hormones associated with the fasted state, and there are Mm -hmm. hormones associated with the eating and having just eaten state. See, that's what people don't understand. There's hormones for certain times and certain hormones for certain not times. Okay, when I was food addiction, there wasn't an hour or 30 minutes when I wasn't eating. So there's parts of my genome, my DNA, that that wasn't activated, meaning I wasn't taking full advantage of the human experience in my eyes, and we're not living to the fullest. And this is why we don't really get to live, because our bodies are struggling, because we're abusing one side of our body and not even using another side, and our body just gives out, in my opinion. Now, the most important thing to understand is that like everything in biology, this is a process that takes time. So insulin and glucose go up when we eat and it takes some period of time for them to go down. Even if we stop eating, they will remain up for some period of time and then go back down. It takes time. Exactly. This is very important because if you look at the scientific literature on fasting, on time-restricted feeding, it's absolutely clear that the health benefits not just the weight loss benefits, but that the health benefits from time-restricted feeding Mm -hmm. occur because certain conditions are met. Eating and fasting has a rich history that goes back many hundreds, if not thousands of years in different cultures and religions. But the science of time-restricted feeding can really mainly be attributed to the incredible work that Sachin has done. And I'm grateful to 
consider him a friend and a colleague, and we consulted at length in anticipation, not so much in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, everything I'm going to tell you is true also for humans, and we know this now from human studies. One of the most important things to take away from this study was that mice that ate a highly palatable, high-fat diet, a great-tasting diet, but only during a restricted feeding window of each 24-hour cycle, maintained or lost weight over time. Whereas mice that ingested the same diet, same amount of calories, but had access to those calories around the clock, gained weight, became obese, and quite sick. And as an additional second point, the mice that restricted their feeding window to a particular portion of eight hours of every 24-hour cycle actually showed some improvement in important health markers And what was even more incredible is that mice that only ate during a particular feeding window also experienced some reversal of some prior negative health effects. So this study really lit up the world and got people excited about time-restricted eating. Now, an important point about when... For humans, the eight-hour eating window... Right, 16 hours of fasting, then you eat eight hours. If you reach that point every day, that's ketosis. You're, you're, you're burning in a natural ketosis pattern, which is what you want to do if you want to eat every day. That's why that'd be my, that's my baseline. Like, I go with 16 hours damn near every day. And the feeding window falls within the 24-hour cycle. It is very important that the feeding window fall during the more active phase of one's day. So for humans, that's typically in the early part of the day or the later part of the day, but not at night. Put very simply, there are a lot of data now pointing to the fact that eating during the nocturnal phase of the 24-hour cycle is very detrimental to one's health. In fact, when we eat can either enhance our health or can diminish our health. Mm -hmm underwent a very regular entrainment, a locking in to the proper 24-hour schedule. And while this was in mice, we now know that this also occurs in humans. I've said before on this podcast, and I'll say it again, that light and when we view light is the primary way in which these genes and the clock systems of our Mm -hmm. body get organized or entrained, meaning matched to the outside light-dark cycle. So viewing light early in the day and in the afternoon and as much as possible all day, great. Ideally, that's sunlight. Avoiding light in the middle of the night is also great. It's great because it causes the increases in particular genes and the decreases in particular genes in every cell throughout your body at the appropriate times. The second most powerful timekeeper, or Zeitgeber as it's called, is food food and when you eat. And in this study, the results they saw underscore this point. What they saw is that the peaks in these clock genes became very regular, and the dips in these clock genes became very regular, and that led to a whole host of really important positive health effects. Conversely, when mice ate whenever they wanted across the 24-hour cycle, these clock genes became really out of whack, and the negative health consequences were the downstream result of these changes in these clock genes. This has now also been shown to be true for humans. So if you want to be healthy, you want your organ health, your metabolic health to be entrained properly, one of the most important things you can do is to view light at the appropriate times of each 24-hour schedule and to not view light at other times of that schedule and to eat at the appropriate time of each 24-hour day. Now, again, there are rare instances that we will discuss when skipping entire days or entire 24-hour cycles of eating can be beneficial. But for now, we're talking about Schedules of time-restricted feeding that involve a window of feeding that falls during your more active phase, so during the daytime, putting aside people that work shift work, during the daytime is when you want to eat. And this eight-hour feeding window provided a very strong reinforcing signal that combines with light to ensure that these genes are expressed at the appropriate times. The short takeaway from this is you probably want to think about and perhaps even engage in time-restricted feeding. So as I mentioned earlier, when mice can eat around the clock, bad things happen. And one of the bad things that happens is that the liver suffers. The liver is involved in all sorts of things, production of important hormones and other factors. 
related to metabolism. And when mice can eat around the clock, their livers got very sick. Fatty deposits in the liver, other factors in the liver, essentially taking down the pathway of liver disease. The time-restricted feeding essentially reversed that or led in many cases to even healthier liver conditions. And that's based on this study, but also additional studies also now in humans. So restricting your feeding to a particular window every 24 hour cycle has clearly been shown now in- That literally shows you fasting literally reverses what the damage you can do. Literally, he was like going from one cycle to the next cycle. One was causing the damage, then the other heal the damage. Overeating caused the damage, constantly eating, not having these windows, making a, the small basis window. He's like in a 24 hour period, they're doing eight hours. That means eight hours of the day they're eating, then the other 16, they're not. That means of that 16, eight, you're sleeping. And that's why I put four before it and after. That's the baseline. Eight hours. It's possible. Mice and in human. And you can reverse your or your main important organ, liver. And people walking around here with fatty liver diseases thinking they can't reverse it when there's a solution. It's hard, but you can do it. To enhance liver health which is wonderful. How does it do this? Well, it happens because food intake, as I mentioned earlier, sets certain conditions in the body that last for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Anytime we eat, whether or not we are a mouse or a human, there's a period of time that's required for so-called digestion, but also gastric emptying and other processes related to breaking down that food and utilizing it. And that is an active process. It requires energy. And that process of breaking down food involves certain cellular function. If they're ongoing throughout the 24-hour cycle or even extended too far across the 24-hour cycle, meaning you're eating across a 14 or a 16-hour or an 18-hour window, that causes serious problems. And this is... Serious problems, he said. Going past a... 12, 14, 16 hour eating window causes serious problems. He didn't say problems. Ser- a scientist says serious problems. You should raise your eyebrows about how many hours of day. What is your smallest window in a week? Are you getting up immediately eating? And are you eating 30 minutes before going to bed? Which is horrible. That means... If you're doing those two things, eating in the first hour you get up or eating the last hour you're going to bed, you're food addicted, first of all. And second of all, you you don't have a small window, which you automatically have serious health problems. Now been established because of the fact that it increases the expression of different proteins and genes in the body, such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1. What are all those things? They are pro-inflammatory markers. Pro-inflammatory markers, meaning your your genetics is struggling to express themselves. So the reason that the liver gets sick when you're eating too often is because inflammatory markers are increased. These inflammatory markers are not inherently bad. They're there for a reason, but they are there in order to respond to certain challenges immune challenges or the ingestion of food and the breakdown of food. But then in an ideal circumstance, they are reduced in the period in which there's no food present in the digestive tract or in which there's very little food present in the digestive tract. So by eating around the clock, you're making yourself sicker. By eating at restricted periods of time each 24-hour day, you're actually making yourself healthier and you are activating certain processes that can positively impact both weight, either maintenance or loss of weight. We'll talk about weight gain a little later and positively impacting things like liver health. Also the expression of different things related to brown fat, the fat that increases your metabolism. We will return to this also a little bit later and blood glucose regulation. So the takeaway from this study, in fact, there are many takeaways from this study. It's so wonderful is that liver health, bile acid metabolism, energy expenditure, 
inflammation, liver metabolites, many, many aspects of our health are impacted by when we eat, not just what we eat. When? When? He already said going over 12, 14, 16 hour eating windows, serious health damage. But when you totally reverse that and go under eight hours, you got maintaining weight, losing weight, and, and health benefits that, that can help you move forward. Literally, just just sitting on he's still sitting on the liver and talking about how fasting in the, in the basis 16 to 8 16 hours of no eating and then 8 hours of eating you get health benefits that's the smallest then we can go bigger but just this baseline as we move forward and we talk about intermittent fasting for eight hour windows, six hour windows, 12 hour windows, for all sorts of different intents and purposes. I wanna to start to establish a foundational protocol that all of us, any of us can use in order to maximize your particular goals. There are some absolutes within this realm of time restricted feeding. Here are a couple of absolutes that you would want to consider. First of all, it pays off in the metabolic sense and in the health sense and in the weight maintenance or loss sense to not ingest any food in the first hour after waking and potentially for longer. So I wanna repeat that. One of the key pillars of intermittent fasting is that for the first hour after you wake up no and potentially for longer to not ingest any food. Exactly. Okay? The second- Do not wake up and go right to eat. I used to get at that and get at that, but when I wasn't eating in the morning, when I was food addicted, I wasn't breaking my fast, which is important, even more important, is breaking your fast with something too that's really beneficial towards your body. But he's saying the first hour is great, but even going further, it's great too, of not eating in the morning. Second major pillar that's well supported by research is that for the two and ideally three hours prior to bedtime, you also don't ingest any food or liquid calories for that matter. And we will talk about what it means to break a fast and whether or not certain liquids, even coffee and tea can break a fast, et cetera, in a few moments. But just as a foundation, it's very clear from the research in humans that not eating any food or ingesting any calories, liquid or otherwise, for the first 60 minutes after waking up each day and for the two to three hours prior to your bedtime, that's ideal for the parameters that we've discussed earlier. All the different things like weight and liver health and metabolic health and so forth is when is it best to fast? So mm. because we are fasting during sleep, it's very clear that it's best to extend the sleep related fast obviously, either into the morning or to start it in the evening. Now, this might seem kind of obvious, but many of you have probably heard of autophagy, which is essentially a cleaning up, a gobbling up of dead cells and cells that are injured or sick. And this is a natural process that occurs, and it occurs mainly during sleep, although not only during sleep. Fasting of any kind does tend to enhance autophagy. It is not the only way to create autophagic conditions. Autophagic conditions can be created simply by following a subcaloric diet. And there are other things that one can do in order to trigger autophagy. But fasting does trigger autophagy. So when we're asleep, the bad cells are getting gobbled up and eaten. And the good cells also are undergoing certain repair mechanisms mainly related to or at least governed by those circadian genes that we talked about earlier, those clock genes. So one thing is certain, that you want your eating window to be tacked or attached to your sleep-based fasting in a way that makes it easier for you to get into the fasted state for a period of time. So we can view that point from the perspective of best, better, and worst, okay? So if you are like most people and you sleep at night, you're waking up somewhere around 6.30, 7 a.m. or maybe even 8 a.m., let's say you were to push your fasting window out such that you started eating at noon 
and then you stopped eating at 6 p.m. Well, then you're not eating from 6 p.m. until, let's say, your bedtime is 10 p.m., but from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., your body is not yet in a fasted state because you just ate. However, you're starting to taper into a fasted state before sleep, and then all through sleep and until the next morning and late morning, you are actually in a fasted state. Now, most people find it very hard to only eat in the middle of the day. So while that's best, it's ideal for sake of the fasting-related improvements in health, let's imagine a different pattern of eating where the feeding window starts in the afternoon, starts around 2 or even 3 p.m. Some people don't have much trouble or they can train themselves to get their Easy. feeding window out to 2 or 3 p.m., and then they will eat Bottom until 10 or 11 p.m. Right? If you do the math, you realize that that feeding window is still pretty short. It still constitutes what we would call intermittent so fasting or time-restricted feeding. But assuming that they go to bed around 11 p.m. or midnight, they are not actually fasted in sleep because for the first six hours or so of sleep, maybe five, but probably more like six hours of sleep, they're still digesting the food that they consumed late in the night. It does appear beneficial to grab a hold of that sleep-related fast, Mm -hmm. meaning you don't want your feeding window to be too close to bedtime. And that's why we Mm -hmm. came up with this kind of foundational pillar that I discussed with Sachin earlier, which is at least no eating for the first hour after waking, but also no eating within two to three hours prior to bed. And because we all need to sleep, and sleep is exceedingly important for our health of all kinds, you want to prioritize sleep, but because we also have to eat, then you start to think about this, and mm, maybe it's not so good to push that feeding window too late in the day because when you go to sleep, you're not actually capitalizing on the sleep-related fasting. Now, it's not just the case that it's easiest to fast while in sleep, although that's true because when we're asleep, typically we're not hungry or looking for food or foraging for food or wanting food or trying to resist food. We're just sleeping. There is something special about the fasting that occurs during sleep because it's associated with a number of processes that relate to the so-called glymphatic system, the movement of lymph-like fluids Mm -hmm. and other fluids through the brain, a kind of sweeping out uh, garbage disposal, if you will, a clearing out of the metabolic debris and some of the autophagy that's Mm -hmm. associated with bad processes in the brain. So we could do a whole episode on this, but essentially during sleep and in particular during fasted states of sleep, we are undergoing a number of automatic cellular processes that clear out debris from our brain, enhance cognition or at least offset dementia. This is now well established, as well as a number of the same processes occurring in the organs of our body. So knowledge, the social constraints and the real life constraints. Some of us, because we want to eat with our family and because our family or our significant others eat around 8 or 9 p.m., and that's the only time we're together, you have to eat late in the day. And that's certainly not a sin. I'm not saying that's good or bad. Here we're trying to establish if... This is when you set boundaries, and then you have to explain about new information coming into your family. You have to express this because you can't just demonize breakfast or dinner. You got to understand everybody's different. Some people value dinner more than breakfast. So they just, they don't care what you do for breakfast. Just be here for dinner. Some people are like, yo, we, we are not going to be here for dinner. So breakfast is more important. Find your rhythm and pattern with your family and figure it out for yourself. You be like, yo, I told my family I'm skipping breakfast. Dinner is way more important to me. I like eating more in the afternoon. I like getting everything done in the morning. And not have to think about food at all. It's way better pattern for me. It just works for me. I rarely eat in the morning. There are some days because of my schedule with work and graveyard is why I need to sleep in the afternoon. So I do eat in the mornings. But most of the time I've been up all morning. Or usually I've been up all mornings when I'm starting my, my schedule with work. But that, that, that just shows you everybody needs a rhythm and pattern. So from both a practical and a health perspective and a purely objective view of how intermittent fasting works and can benefit us, starting to eat each day somewhere around 10 a.m. or around noon and then allowing a feeding window that goes until 6 or maybe 8 p.m., 
That seems to me, at least based on the data and what I understand about typical cultures where people eat in the daytime and in the evening, that seems to me like the kind of schedule that will allow you to get the most out of intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, but does not set you up to be really out of sync with the social rhythms in most cultures. If you think about it from the perspective of, say, a noon to eight feeding window, what you'll find is that you're able to eat lunch with others, if you like, or by yourself. You will be able to eat dinner at a reasonable hour, at least in most countries and most cultures, eating dinner somewhere between 6.30 and 7 p.m. is typical. When you say a feeding window that goes until 8, that doesn't mean sitting down to dinner at 8. That means your last bite of food or ingestion of any liquid calories was at 8 p.m. Assuming that you go to bed somewhere between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., that allows this tapering off or this transition from feeding to a fasted state and still allows you to cap. I go in window for me is right in between that 12 to 7.30, between that window because I have a lot of energy. I don't, well, not a lot of energy, but it's that time of day where I can settle down, eat, and not stress about food. So that's my window I like to eat in between that time. When I'm not eating between that time, I'm usually taking a nap or sleeping or getting ready for work or keeping my same sleeping pattern for graveyards. So that that eating window, sometimes I wake up and I eat, then I go to work. That'd be the only time I eat because I want to eat before 7.30 and my work around by 6.30. I'm just getting started. Sometimes I bring food to work. I bring it back full of like fruit and vegetables. And that's pretty much it. Like I might have some kind of little, you know what I mean, snack, but not too much because I was addicted to so much stuff. So I try not to trigger that stuff. But that eating window in between I say twelve to one thirty to twelve to seven thirty is a good one. I usually pick a six hour or a four hour window or a one hour window in between that time. I really like the one meal a day when I have a lot going on and I'm working a whole lot or just not eat at all. Doing a three day fast on a weekly basis I really find it beneficial and really don't have to worry about food capitalize on the special period of fasting that is sleep-related fasting. And again, I want to emphasize that the fasting that occurs during sleep is vital, and eating too close to sleep will disrupt that fasting-related sleep. Now, there are a number of caveats and details related to this, and there's an important caveat and detail related to people that are specifically interested in increasing or maintaining muscle mass. So, First, let's talk about food volume and food type and how that relates to whether or not you quickly or slowly enter a fasted state. Because clearly, when we talk about a feeding window, that feeding window could include any number of different foods. It could involve cake and ice cream, pizza, hamburgers, plants, fruit, whatever it is, or it could involve just fats or just proteins, etc., There are at least three factors that are going to govern how quickly you transition from ingesting food to a fasted state. Remember, as you ingest your last bite or sip of calories, that's not when the fast begins. That might be when the fasting begins on your watch or on one of these apps that I'll refer to later, which can help you track your fasting and eating windows. But that's not when it actually begins because your body is still seeing food. You're actually carrying around food Mm -hmm. inside of you. Even though you're not putting it into your mouth, you're still eating in some sense. So it should be somewhat obvious that very large meals are going to take longer to digest than very small meals. So that will impact how... That's why I have my large meals usually right in the middle of my eating window. So I usually start light and go heavy and back light. So I like the two-hour eating windows because it, it takes me first 30 minutes. I'm eating very light. I'm not trying to rush it. Did not lose it. Got a little heavy, then heavier, then light out of that, depending on it because eating two hours and jumping back into a fast usually, <laughs> like, I don't really, my ketosis is burning at a high level. You really don't even knock yourself out of it too long. 
so that big heavy meal like I, I don't I see 90 minutes sometimes an hour 60 minutes then you're riding to a fasting state but if you're a type of person who never enemy I've been in many fast every day then I block fast three times a week usually a, a, a 20 a couple 24 three twenty fours or 48 or depending on the schedule or I might just do the 72 but I feel like when you're in this rhythm like this, this is why I don't worry about when I should eat because it's like I'm always in this high burning state to where when I put like I'm just a, a burning bulletproof machine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's bulletproof. Like you throw anything in, it's just going to burn it up. Slowly or quickly, you migrate from a fed state to a fasted state. There's no way I can spell out what exact volume of food you should ingest based on the size of your stomach and et cetera. But the important thing here is to establish a feeding window that you can comfortably manage, okay? Meaning that on average, you can obey a six hour feeding window or an eight hour feeding window or a 10 hour feeding window. And then to place that feeding window in a social and life context that you can manage on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two key points that have been gleaned from the scientific data about this feeding window and when to place it. I feel like it's easy once you can recognize your food addicted and then some of the stuff that you're raised with to believe in were totally made up for marketing purposes. Like breakfast is the most important meal. Totally made up. Nobody cannot find any facts about that actually this information that he's given here just five minutes just a couple minutes ago telling you like the first hour or two of of waking up you should not be eating gives you the best health benefits and eating three hours before going to bed gives you the best health benefits why did people come up with this notion of breakfast is the most important meal like where did that come up when He's literally showing research with time restricted eating in eight or smaller hours of eating windows gives you positive health benefits and eating over the 12 hours, which is half of the day you're awake, is giving you detrimental health problems. Where did this notion come up that breakfast is the most important meal? They're still preaching this stuff and people still can't find where are you getting this information for in this brainwashing? It's been there. It's, it's hard to unbrainwash it, but that's how people are. And that's where we got to stop the generation. Of course, wake up in the, in the morning eating these heavy starch meals that is like weighing us down when we should be being active and moving nonstop. Yes, there's some cultures on the other side of the planet. Yeah, they eat completely different because that's how the food rhythm is over there. They, 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 they're working off other stuff, and then I know, like the, the whole this whole different world out there that that knows about fasting and intermediate fasting, and certain times of the day to eat, and certain not times of the day to eat. It's depending on lifestyle choices, and you should match it and not be, oh, I just grab and go snacks or or. Oh, I'm gonna I'm eat huge meal when, whenever I sit down and and and, and burn out your your insulin, burn out your pancreas and your insulin don't work because you're always eating these big healthy meals and can't even don't even realize you're eating so much starch. It's really just sugar mixing in your stomach. It's creating alcohol. People don't even realize that all these complex sugars and they're making alcohol in your stomach. It. And this is based on a really important experiment that Sachin and his colleagues have been doing. There's a website that they have, a zero-cost website called My Circadian Clock. You can go to this website um, free of cost. There are a number of important resources there. But what they've done is they've examined the feeding behavior of thousands of people. People will take a picture of the food they're about to eat, and it enters into their account, maybe your account if you create one, on My Circadian Clock. And they do this over many days or weeks. What's great about this is it establishes what's essentially called a fetogram, a time in which people ate. 
And a number of important findings have emerged from these fetograms across large populations of people in different time zones, with different schedules, et cetera. First of all, almost everybody underestimates their feeding window, meaning people who think that they are on an eight-hour feeding window or six-hour feeding window, when their data are analyzed, it almost is always the case that they're actually on a feeding window that's one or even two hours longer than they think. You think, well, how could that possibly And this is why I track my fast, because when I wasn't tracking, I was noticing, like, yo, I'm, I'm going overboard. I'm not holding myself accountable to the max. And this is why I started tracking, and this is why I applied myself with tracking my fastest, and this is why I like the app I have. Because I can start, you can start your own tribes and you can join multiple tribes with fasting. And it, it's kind of amazing once you realize, like, being in the state of ketosis, how for a certain period of my life I wasn't nowhere near that. And when you're a young kid, like, your body is always in ketosis because you're growing and your body needs to burn that energy off to grow. But once you hit a certain age, you notice. A lot of people start having getting heavy, and if, like you said, around puberty, people are triggered because of the food, and it's our hormones and the food being triggered with it at the same time. So it gets to that point where you got to understand, like yo, what you intake in, and a certain rhythm and like rhythm and pattern with your body. Really be if people are taking their first bite at noon and they're taking their last bite at 8 p.m., well that must mean that they are on that feeding window of eight hours. And no. it turns out that yeah, people, it's clear that if you'd like to be on a 10 hour feeding window, that you should probably select an eight hour feeding window mm -hmm. because there's always a little bit of a taper on either side of that eating window. Very few people are extremely strict about these eating windows. It's just hard to do in the context of life events and social gatherings and, and family and so forth. Okay, so as we... So why time restricted eating is too much. It's like you don't know what's going to go on with your life. That's why it's easier. Sometimes I might be planning to break my fast at one. I don't break it into six because of what's going on in life. Just life shit happens. Like, you know, I got two kids, two dogs. Dog get out, kid acting up at school or or the kid needs to go to the doctor or something or, or there's traffic and I'm stuck over here and I'm supposed to be over here, over here, over here. That's why time restricted eating is not the idea because you put that too strict you need to be flexible with fasting and be like oh i'm a, i'm planning to work my fast at uh one two o'clock and you're busy in between 12 and one and so and you see that or you be like all right i'm gonna break it at 11 you still might be in and just start up as ketosis if i break mine usually at 11 i'm gonna stop at 7 7 30 that usually is 16 hours so that's cool. But if I want to be like, nah, I don't want to really want to rush eat, I'm going to eat later. I'm just going to wait till later. I'm going to wait till five, six, seven, whatever it takes. But I'm in a higher state of ketosis when I'm breaking or leaving later. So when I break it, and then I usually I'm not going to eat too long. Like he said, you want to like have a big window before you go to sleep. Yeah, that is true. But when you're in a higher state of fasting, all this stuff, it, it gets pushed back a little bit. It's like you're you you're you're more of a burning machine, and so the food you put in your tank is gonna burn off faster rather than sit longer because you have a longer window. That's why I like shorter windows because it's like your tank is a better burning fuel than when it's a longer window. And it takes you got to look at your body like your stomach as an engine. When you put heavier heavier pretty much heavier dense of foods in there, it's going to take longer to break down. Yes, it's a shortcut with the meat and the breads and everything because it's way more compound, compact together. But at the same time, it takes your body longer to break it down. So the energy source is more, <clears throat> it's more, it comes with a, a pro and a loss. It comes with a pro and a loss. Like, literally, it's like you got to get to the point where you understand that, 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 that energy source is such more denser so it's going to take longer to break down and you want to be get back into a passing state that's why i stick to fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds keep it simple make sure i mix it up and, and throw in the salads in there 
Inter and trust me, you'll be good. And I use fish as a luxury item. Like, that's how. It the other nice thing about selecting a slightly shorter eating window than is comfortable for you is that it takes into account that as you take your last bite or your last sip of calories, there's this taper. time or taper before which you are actually in a fasted state. Mm -hmm. like and saying, because you're, you're eating different right. things on different days, presumably, some foods leave your gut more quickly. Some things spike your insulin and your glucose more than others. Sometimes you eat more fat, sometimes less fat. This allows you to fall well within the margins of the benefits of time-restricted feeding that have been demonstrated in humans, which generally involve an eight-hour window or so. So I think this eight-hour window or six-hour window is a good thing to shoot for for most people. Some people, and we will discuss the exceptions, but some people truly are exceptions to this. They just require more food. And along those lines, I just now briefly want to touch on some of the studies that have looked at using a very short feeding window of about four hours. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, a number of people are doing the so-called one meal per day or are restricting their feeding window to just four hours or six hours. And that turns out to be an interesting strategy. And the data around it actually are a little bit surprising. One surprising thing to leap out of this massive literature review on time-restricted feeding in humans is that relatively short feeding windows of say four to six hours do so produce a number of positive health effects, things like increased insulin sensitivity, which we know is good. Remember type two diabetes is a reduction in insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. improvements in beta cell function and the mm -hmm. pancreas, decreased blood pressure, mm -hmm. decreased oxidative stress, high decreases in things like evening appetite. Again. So positive health effects and psychological effects in general but when we start thinking about performance in work and in sport, and when we start considering hormone health and hormone production, fertility, that's when we can really start to look at the seven to nine hour feeding window versus the four to six hour feeding window versus the one meal per day type feeding window with some different objectivity. We can start to look at it through a different lens because it turns out. I'm saying everything under eight hours. Feeding window is the best way to go. I personally like four to six. The energy level I like when when you go under, let's say two hours eating window. That's when people overeat because they think they can eat that whole two hour window. I like the four to six because I usually split it up into two meals and I do something in between to help keep that just to keep that libido because I don't want to be sitting down over two hours just eating at one time. It's going to be so over two hours. I'm going to split it up into two meals. Now, that's how I usually do it with the four or six hour window. But when it comes to doing the one meal a day, those are the days I usually work. If I can get, the, if I want to get that one meal in, I will get that one meal in. But usually I skip because if, if I'm busy doing other things in between my work schedule and life, it's like food's not that important to me at this time. It's like I didn't load it up enough on my on my feed days when um usually the weekends with my family when I'm eating a six I'm pushing more of a six to eight hour window rather than a four to six that I'm usually doing but it's, it it comes down to like knowing that we're not in the scarcity food we don't need to eat every day uh, you literally can do a water fast and have benefits and still have the same amount of energy you had day one and day two. And it's like it's, it's even better energy when I'm fasting than when I'm eating. So that's why I choose to be in a fasting state and eating the smaller windows. It's just way more beneficial for you. And health wise, you're not sluggish. Like you're you're, you're burning on lighter fuel and you're moving faster and quicker. And, and, and your brain is thinking better. So I, I advise it. Like let's get this going. That when you place the feeding window and how long that feeding window is actually will impact a number of other things, in particular hormones that can be very important for a number of things related to sex and reproduction, can be related to performance at work, performance in athleticism. And there are excellent studies on this, that eating protein early in the day supports muscle tissue maintenance and or growth. And 
in this study, they also looked at the effects of supplementing so-called BCAAs, branched-chain amino acids, which is popular in uh, bodybuilding circles and in strength training circles. And BCAAs are essential components of a number of different foods, but can also be supplemented. The takeaway of this study is pretty straightforward, however. The takeaway is if your main interest is maintaining and or building muscle, then it can be beneficial to ingest protein early in the day. You would still want to obey this, what we're calling a kind of foundational rule of no, not eating any food for the first hour post-waking, or at least the first hour post-waking. And the cutoff for when you would want to eat protein would be sometime before 10 a.m. And there I'm averaging across a number of different such that, let's say you wake up at 7 a.m., your main interest is in... Uh, hypertrophy or maintenance of muscle, then you would want to ingest some protein sometime before 10 a.m. But obviously, if you're interested in getting the health effects of intermittent fasting, the health effects, that you wouldn't ingest any food uh, for at least the first 60 minutes upon waking. Now, it's not as if at 10.01 a.m. a gate slams shut and you can't generate hypertrophy. Of course, that's not the case. However, it's very interesting that it doesn't matter when the resistance training, the load-bearing exercise occurs in the 24-hour cycle. So whether or not, in other words, people are training early in the day or they're training late in the day, it still appears that ingesting protein early in the day favors hypertrophy Mm -hmm. or that one is better or, I should say, more easily able to access hypertrophy by way of these clock-regulated protein synthesis mechanisms by ingesting protein early in the day. In no way, shape, or form does this study say that ingesting protein later in the day is somehow bad for you. It just emphasizes the positive effects of ingesting protein early in the day for sake of muscle maintenance and or hypertrophy. So if you're somebody who's mainly concerned with muscle maintenance and hypertrophy, then it may make sense to move that feeding window earlier in the day. And certainly there are people out there who are interested in muscle maintenance and hypertrophy who aren't doing intermittent fasting at all. And that's also perfectly fine. But this just so happens to be an episode about intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding. There are, of course, modes of eating where one eats small meals spread throughout the day or weights meals differently such that meals early in the day are larger than later in the day or vice versa. There are a near infinite number of ways to organize this. But if you are somebody who's interested in deriving the many clearly established health effects of time-restricted feeding and you are somebody who would like to maintain or build muscle, then ingesting proteins in the early part of the day would be important to you, at least on the basis of these results. And this- Okay, is that important? You still want to get the benefits of fasting? All right, eat earlier. Yeah, eat at 9. Eat at 8 and cut it off at 1 or 2. And then go <laughs> almost 6-7 hours before you go to sleep with no eating. Do high training. Go to sleep. Wake up. Stretch. Do some more you know what I mean? Do do a little bit of work and then eat. I'm telling you, like these schedules are not that hard, especially when people can work. Oh, I can work early in the morning at my job. I work from six to three, or oh, I, I don't go into the afternoons, or I don't go in until late in the night. I work graveyard, so I fit my fastest schedule to my lifestyle. Pretty. Because time and time again, our history genome has shown this, or or the weather comes in and changes everything and killed all the crops and the animal overnight. It didn't happen. Naturally, in the wild, animals can sense bad weather, and they can get away from humans. We're way more. We now need my animals to stay over here and not leave, and we put them in a in a hell spot, and they die. Now you don't got no more cattle. All your plants is gone because you don't understand the balance of nature. We are all one with nature, and so we need to play our role, not separate ourselves, and then that's how we get problems that we can't handle. We can't. We don't have all the solutions of human. That's why we created a working environment where you can't keep working and working and working and nonstop and you never relax. But we're the only species on this planet that does that. We destroy what we create. What we like literally we destroy our home to create something better that we already have. That's the greatest that we can't replace, which is the Earth. Therefore, that eight-hour window that we we've established as more or less ideal shifted to the later part of the day might not be as beneficial for you. 
Now, I can just personally say that for me, when I wake up in the morning, it's very easy for me to not eat until noon or 1 or 2 p.m. That's a natural rhythm. A natural rhythm. I'm telling you, every a lot of scientists explain it, but you get up at 6, 7 o'clock, it's a natural rhythm not to eat until 12 to 2 o'clock. That's a natural rhythm. Eating early in the day is actually somewhat of a challenge. I discussed this point with Sachin because we were talking about how is it that one can move their feeding window or place themselves onto a different schedule of intermittent fasting. And it's very clear that one needs to provide a transition period in order for that to happen. You should allow... Yes, okay. This is why my first six months going into deep fasting, I did a protocol where like each month I did something that was a ch challenging in fasting, meaning I started off just doing... 24 hour fast once a week. The next month, I went to doing it 36s, 48s, 50s. You know what I mean? Each, every week, try to do it. I, my limit was two days. I'm starting to go under two days, or exactly two days, over two days. I did that for a month. Then I went to the next month, and next month, and next month. Worked my way all the way up to a six day fast. So I was comfortable doing it. I had my, had my results. I had my. Like, I have my plan. Yes, once you get over this hump, you want to stay in this lifestyle. You will want this energy. This energy is primal energy. Like, you'll be at your tip top. Like, I'm telling you, not even have to work out. And you can maintain weight and eat what you want to eat in your windows. Like he said, it doesn't matter what you eat. It's when you eat and how long you eat. We are humans. We, we've survived through many things on this planet. Famine and all sorts of ways from human confliction and from nature and from being just stupid humans. We didn't lost track of food and been had to go through famine and starvation and we still survive. So why is there, oh, there's just only certain food to eat. But plants are all sensitive to weather. When it get too damn hot around the equator, no fruit can survive. When it get too cold, no vegetables can survive. What is, what is left? You know what I mean? There's only certain things that are left that humans need to survive. That's why we can break down anything. But to survive off certain things, different story. To be eating a luxury item like red meat on a regular basis, no. You're not supposed to be eating that, that stuff three times a day, every single day. That's what I was, and I wasn't educated on food and what you should eat from food. And that's what I was just doing. Didn't, didn't realize that eating these certain meats, you know, checking my sources, I'm over here eating clone food. And it was back in the day before it was even popular today. But you got to allow yourself this transition period, that hump. You got to see it as a big hump. You got to get over it with fasting. That You got to set up yourself. You got to go, all right, I'm going to take this year off, you guys, and start being more disciplined with myself with food. And realize, like, yo, you're food addicted. It's ever neurotic focus on this. I think that most all people could benefit from a time-restricted feeding schedule, but they should really think hard about what they can stick to on a regular basis and understand that they tend to underestimate the feeding window that they actually are partaking in and that they should place that feeding window in a portion of the 24-hour cycle that they can be consistent on most days. So there's a fun and exciting concept related to this, which is glucose clearing. You may have heard the old adage that if you take a 20 or 30 minute walk after dinner yeah. that it accelerates the Stand rate at which you digest that food. And indeed it does. Clearing out of glucose from your system no. can be accomplished through a number of different means, but light movement or exercise does increase gastric Digitous. emptying time. So for instance, if you were to eat a meal that ended at 8 p.m. and to, and then plop to the couch, watch TV or get on your computer or go to sleep, it would be five or six hours until you have transitioned from a fed state to a fasted state. However, you can accelerate that considerably by taking a 20 or 30 minute just light walk. It doesn't have to be speed walking. It certainly doesn't have to be jogging, but just walking outside or moving around. So or moving around. glucose like, clearing is an important of aspect like of the transition the from the fed so. state to the fasted state. You know I mean? And just a light walk can allow you to do that. Now, if you can't get outside, some people will go um, through the gymnastics, literally, of doing things like air squats and yep. push-ups and things like that. And air indeed, squats. those will increase the expression of things like GLUT4 and things that mobilize glucose into squats. muscles and things of that air sort. Squats. But 
you know, under most conditions, most Stretch. people aren't doing push-ups after dinner. Or certainly, if you've had a big meal, just Don't taking a light no walk can meal. be beneficial. Don't eat. In addition, 100%. you could consider doing intense exercise. Don't eat. Now, you wouldn't necessarily want to do that immediately after eating. So, Don't let's take a look at what high-intensity training of any kind does to blood glucose. No. Because in this case, it turns out that when you do high-intensity training actually has opposite effects on blood glucose depending on whether or not you do it early or later in the day. So a fairly recent study looked at so-called HIT training, high-intensity interval training, which of course can take many different forms. It can take Hit the form of circuit really training happens. with weights. It can take the form of you know, burpees and push-ups and sprints and all sorts of different things. But high-intensity interval training is typically training that gets people's heart rates up you know, well above 70% of maximum. And then brief periods of rest and then repeating and how long the high intensity interval training of course I would say like air squats is good pull ups uh, and lower body stuff so I have two dogs go outside run around with your dogs for five minutes not run around but just play with them you know what I mean so take them for a walk you know what I mean some people love taking their dog for a walk I'll go into the backyard and just run around not full blown but like out of breath run around just like tussle with them a little bit, just get active, squat down with them and push them around. They love when I get like dirty with them, and so that's what I do. I got two big dogs, so I just push them around and everything, get active with them. And you got kids too. Usually, kids they don't, they naturally don't want to be super full. That's why they always go back and forth to the kitchen. That's kind of you want to be in between there. You don't want to be half the way. You want to get to that eighty percent, that seventy to eighty, eighty-five percent full. Do not get to 100%. This book's explaining it. But one of the biggest lessons I got from it is um, don't eat past 100%. In these certain areas, people, they never eat to 100%. Never eat to their full. And they stay active. Make of understanding glucose clearing. If you have ingested food throughout the afternoon and evening and late in the day and you're thinking about going to sleep and you'd like to enter sleep in a way that is less fed and more fasted, then engaging in high intensity interval training in the afternoon will lower, or evening I should say, will lower blood glucose. And in that way will help you accelerate your transition into the fasted state, provided you don't ingest something after the high intensity interval training. Now, is the increase in blood glucose that occurs from high intensity interval training early in the day, is that detrimental? Not necessarily so. That oftentimes is associated with the shuttling of nutrients to the muscles that have just done a lot of hard work. So it's not that high intensity interval training should not be done early in the day. In fact, for many people, including myself, training early in the day, just for the way that my psychology and biology works is always better for me than training later in the day. And the other important thing to mention is that high intensity interval training done late in the day can be beneficial from the perspective of glucose clearing, lowering blood glucose, and helping transition from the fed to the fasted state in preparation for sleep. However, if you're ingesting caffeine or anything to engage in that high-intensity interval training in a way that prevents you from getting to sleep, well, then it's going to be detrimental overall. So the reason I mention this is, of course, because it's nice to know that light walks after dinner or any other meal for that matter, or high intensity interval training, provided it's done in the second half of the day, can lower blood glucose and speed the transition from fed to fasted states. But I also mention it because what we are really trying to achieve when we partake in intermittent fasting, so-called time-restricted feeding, is what we're really trying to do is access unfed states or fasted states. It's not really about when you eat and what you do. It's about extending the duration of the fasting period as long as you can in a way that's still compatible with your eating, right? Not the other way around. And this gets back to this key feature of our biology, which is that what we eat, when we eat, when we exercise, when we view light, it's about setting a context or a set of conditions in your brain and body. So it's not so much about the activities that you undergo, it's about the activities you undergo and their relationship to one another over time. And so in this way, it really beautifully highlights the way that your biology is interacting all the time. Light is setting when you're going to be awake and when you're going to be asleep. Mm -hmm. When you eat is going to be determining when you're going to be awake and when you're going to be asleep. Sun and when you eat is also going to be determining 
when you are able to clear out debris from your brain and body and repair the various cells and mechanisms of your body, when you're able to reduce those inflammatory cytokines throughout your body. And this is really the beauty of time-restricted feeding, which is it's not really about restricting your feeding. It's about accessing the beauty of the fasted state. Yes. Now, there are other ways to clear out blood yes, glucose. Yes, yes, the fasting state. When you're activated, living in this fasting state lifestyle, when you create this, you see how it's just more more pure energy in my eyes. Like, it's, n- it's nothing that you can wrap up and sell to me or put it in a bottle and capitalize. They can give me the same results that fasting can maintain on a regular basis. And the only way you can access that is by being disciplined with yourself and realizing, like, yo, I'm in the rat race with this food addiction. Like, I'm playing this. I'm in, stuck in the holiday season. I'm stuck in whenever somebody has something, and, like, they shove it in my mouth. My mouth is open for it. You know what I mean? You got to be that close. You got to shut it down. If you want that energy, if you, you like, some people get it off accomplishing things. Yeah, that's only one part of it, but just imagine if you can really feel that personal high of yours. If you had a cleaner vessel, it wasn't clogged up and backed up. You can really feel and express yourself. That involve supplements or prescription drugs. These are so-called glucose disposal agents. Glucose disposal agents, such as metformin, which is a prescription drug, or berberine, which is an over-the-counter substance, will lead to very dramatic reductions in blood glucose. And so they shift you from a fed to a fasted state. And I know many people who take berberine before eating meals that include a large number of carbohydrates, for instance, as a way to clear out glucose. Now, I've tried berberine before, and what I can tell you is that if you take berberine, which, by the way, is very much like metformin, its effects are almost identical to metformin, in fact, but it's much less expensive and it's over the counter. Yeah. If you take berberine and you have not ingested carbohydrates, many people, including myself, experience a splitting headache. You become hypoglycemic because mm-hmm. it is a glucose clearing agent. So if you're going to experiment with things like metformin and or berberine or similar, you yeah, want to be very cautious that you're not clearing out blood glucose that's already low. And the dose response for this varies tremendously from one individual to the next. And there's a strong circadian component. So when I did a nine-day fast, I didn't refeed with stuff that was cleansing like that. Usually I do a herbal detox tea after like a two, three-day fast. But anything over four and bigger, you don't want to do nothing like a, like a like like anything like that to clean out the push like a glucose cleaner like that like a metformer or berberine like i don't really experiment with pharmaceuticals like that but i will with herbs where i mix them in certain like there's a citrus detox you can do there's the like when you mix together spirulina and Echinacea and do a certain mix of these certain things, combinations. Like, yeah, you can get this glucose push, and I understand it because that's usually what I'm used doing with breaking my fast with my tea or herbal teas with. But it's on a lighter level, and it's more of a beneficial with strength and everything. So it comes down to just educating yourself about how, like, you want to break your fast, and, and I know, like, Doctor. D- David Sinclair is the one that brought up metformin and other people are saying berberine is similar to metformin it's cheaper and it's a more of a natural leaning leaning towards the more natural way because it's found in a plant but it's still relying on a substance to do a shortcut for you it's something that I don't understand you know what I mean it's like why stay disciplined and you just want to do a shortcut so that you know you can work out before and after you eat to help give you this glucose push and clean that that really we should always be striving for so some people react very well to berberine early in the day but find that later in the day it provides extreme headaches for some people it's the opposite so i caution you in exploring things like berberine and metformin that you should expect to experience a number of physical and psychological Mm -hmm. effects 
that may work for you, might be great for you, but might. It's funny because you can naturally do this. You can naturally feel these. It's glucose push when, let's say you're in a deep fasting state, like over 24 hours, and you move too fast, you'll feel it. <laughs> you'll feel it when your heart, like, you'll do something unexpected, like, all right, you see something about to fall and you catch it, and you move too fast, and then you just, after you, right after you do it, like, you catch it, you just feel this rush, like, oh, I accomplished something, but this rush is pushing something. You're like, whoa, hold up. You feel a little lightheaded. That's the same kind of headache, lightheadedness that's going on. With, that's what they describe. I don't know. I haven't taken that stuff. I don't really experiment with pharmaceuticals like that. So might also not be great for you. Nowadays, there are a number of commercially available continuous glucose monitors. I've tried one of these. It involves putting uh, a, a, what's essentially a patch with a little needle that goes into your skin, which is continuing continually, excuse me, monitoring your blood yeah, glucose, and you can look at it at an app on your phone, and you can learn a lot that way about how different foods impact the meditation, increases and decrease you know, in blood glucose. You if you're doing you experiments with berberine or metformin, you can see how those impact your blood glucose. You can see Take how exercise, HIIT training, or otherwise impact, impacts blood glucose. Excuse me again. You can feel blood. It's very hard to assess blood glucose. Like when I broke fast, eating four, six oranges, and I ate four in a row, then I had to stop and took a break. And I was like, I looked at my hands and I felt, I felt my litmus system moving. It was a three day fast and I broke it with six oranges. And I was like, wow, I can feel, I can feel my blood from my toes to my fingers to the top of my head. And like my heart was on a smooth rhythm with it. And I was like, wow, vitamin C is a beast when it can do stuff like that. And no other, no other fruit. Some other fruit can do it. Watermelon can do it. You got to eat enough of it. But they, they even tell you when you go into the fruititarian lifestyle with, with detoxing, like watch out for vitamin C. Watch out for oranges, grapefruits. It, it'll really give you a big push. And I waited till I was more advanced and I broke my faster one. And they gave me that push. I felt like I was Goku. <laughs> if you understand what I mean with anime, I felt like I was like charged up to the max. Like, uh, I had already did a lot, and I was already on a three-day fast. I thought I ate those, th I ate those six oranges, and I went on another like almost 48-hour fast just after that, and I had a uh, like, bag full of oranges. That was like they was big, small, and everything. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And that's when I was experimenting with mono fruit fasting and that blood glucose. And I know a lot of people don't favor fructose because their body don't perform well with it, but my body. Is the best fuel is fructose and how it feels in a fasting state and even in out of a fasting state how is I can feel the difference between fruit when I eat drink when I bite into a fruit and I like drink from the fruit and I suck compared to when that goes in my body compared to when I eat something dry and hard and it takes away like when you add fruit to a, to a cup full of water it adds to it when you add a piece of bread or oil it takes away the water and that's the same thing that happens inside your body and with that fructose energy it works better with glu like <laughs> that glucose it doesn't even it just wants that fructose it doesn't even really that glucose is the combinations that your body put aside and that's how you get the glucose and that's how you get energy but hey i'm telling you my body personally with with, with, with these pushes that he's telling that people on purpose, I don't really understand, especially if you're working out, you're constantly working out type person, like you should be able to feel these pushes back and forth and not be like, like it's the food you're eating, like, like, like eat, eating these flowers, eating these hard sugars and these hard salts that are fortified and bleached, like that's what's slowing you down. And it's, you gotta take these very hard pushers, these blood pushers, that's gonna very dangerous for some people. Some people, yeah, they can maintain it. And I'm telling you, as a person that was pre-diabetic at 14 years old, like nah, doing these little shortcuts, like you don't want to get kids on a younger age stuck on this stuff, thinking, oh, there's a shortcut, there's a shortcut to this, because I was that type of person, because I had five, six family members on diabetes pills and medications and this one's working and this one's not working we don't know what's really working oh well my doctor this and that and it comes down to what drug company is selling the best for you to still have a cheat code in your life 
they they feel in this side so they can feel this side at the same time and it's like I don't like getting caught up in these supplements and these shortcuts especially when he's literally breaking down right here that yo doing a light workout after after you eat can throw you into a fasting state instead of just taking these medications they can throw you into a fasting state or taking these medications in the beginning of the day before your before your feast time can't or clear out your glucose so it won't be so hard so why is your glucose like building up like this are you really that lazy you really not that active with like type of person like it is it's like he's saying like 20 minute walks like light subtle walks and I'm a fidgeter type of person but I like to relax too and he said it at the beginning this fidgeter type of people you burn calories without even doing too much just being yourself and that's how I feel like people should be active on the like active all the time and not just at a standstill with what they want to do and it comes down to understanding like how you operate with, with your blood and understanding when you put in these certain type of elements with these pharmaceuticals inside of inside of your body you got to realize like what else affects is having with you with the food you eat because doc the doctor that explains my foreman has a specific order he eats this food with so it can breaks down in his body and absorb and so when it comes down to with this metformin and berberine and all this other stuff understanding that it's just doing a blood push and you can do this with a basic workout, a basic walk, or a basic just lifestyle being active instead of waking up in the morning and putting this other stuff inside your blood, like like the like the fortified and the bleached hard flours and sugars and salts inside your bodies that slowing down your blood and people I ain't seen literally family members like pulled out blood and it was like my blood was like sap it was like this and that because you have so much protein and so much salt and sugar in your blood that yeah it's turned into a pace it's turned into a sapping you, nothing can't move your blood we got they gotta take it out put it in the dialysis and put it back inside your body that's what they did to my own grandma and I watched that because of our healthy unhealthy lifestyle because of eating this stuff that literally they will have you addicted to it and yeah food addiction is real the main stuff they have on the counters is preservative. It's sitting there preserved, and it would be preserved inside your body if you don't know how to move your own blood. And they're going to rely on you to go buy this stuff to push your blood because you won't know how to push your own blood. You don't know how to get this crap out of your, these toxins out of your blood. You can't go on a two-day fast, a three-day fast. And this is the simple stuff. I went on a nine-day fast and got some results and still want to go on a bigger one because, yo, that's what the universe, that's what my creator is leading me to. It's like, yo, this is what is the truth. You're better without. And they, they over here, other humans are selling me, nope, this is shortcut. We made this. This is better than nature. This is, you don't have to rely on this. You can just rely on us. And it's like, no, you shouldn't be relying on people like that. Rely on yourself. Find out your information. Go to the source. And, and, and depict it like this is what I did with fasting this is why like I understand it's not what you eat it's when you eat and how you eat because once you understand about like getting to the reward system in your body and understanding like when you reach your reward it's good to sit down and eat your cake too like we live in a society where they, like, it's not okay to sit down and eat your cake and enjoy it how you want to enjoy it and people Oh, why won't you hurry up and eat? Like, no, I don't want to race eat and stress and, you know what I mean? Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. It's not like we, we living in a rich time where we still got to hurry up and go eat to work. Or you living in this rat way. It's not understanding why you're in a rush to eat and a rush to go do this because they, 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 they're they fueling this with this addictive lifestyle because it's more than just food. It comes to a lifestyle, people trying to hurry up and eat, and not, now you ain't even absorbing nothing. Like the food just going through, you pushing it through your body, and you eating three times a day, and then you having all these other problems. Well, I eat three times a day, and I'm deficient in this and that. How does that make any sense? Yeah, because you're not really absorbing what you eat. And you're over here in this rat race, being lost in it, and just eating just because it's, they said this is good food. That's what they advertising. 
not taking things serious. You got to take things dead serious when you put it inside your body and understand when is the right time to eat and not to eat and how to like, move your glucose. I can tell when my body's moving, especially at the, like, especially I'm experimenting now. Like, I went through a nine-day fast, and then I refeed for a whole week, and I see that when I'm in these refeeding windows, when I was, I wasn't doing a, a perfect fasting window, I was doing the bases, base of the 16 and 8s that I, that I say the baseline to do, and even after that, like, doing a height fasting and then coming back into a normal kind of baseline lifestyle like it like literally all this food is literally just just to blow you up you know what i mean like you're always feeling bloated always having to go to the bathroom and guess what you're using more fueling more of their system just fueling more of the system and it comes down to understanding like what you put in your body do you need these shortcuts or you need to be a cleaner vessel you can push and pull your stuff on your own glucose without a continuous blood glucose monitor and if you're not using one you're mainly going to be re relying on subjective things like oh i feel like i have low blood sugar or i feel uh shaky like i have high blood sugar or shaky because you have low blood sugar so this is meditating and understanding your body so when people go into this it's kind of they talk shit like oh you really don't know you just you're just guessing and suspecting like yeah if you sit down and meditate and really feel your blood you can tell if your blood sugar is low your blood pressure is high you can tell by just if you have the motivation to go do something or not if you have a lot of energy maybe your blood sugar is high it's bad when your blood sugar is high and you don't have a lot of energy different story okay there's different telltale signs you can read the body and tell like oh these certain elements telling me your blood sugar is very high and you don't have a lot of energy but when you when you have a lot of sugar in your blood, you should have a lot of energy. That means you just ate something, and you should be you you. you like it doesn't make sense. Just like when people have a lot of like when you have a lot of protein in your blood, what does that lead to? Heart attack. Your heart is beating, and you're not moving. <laughs> your heart is beating too fast, and you're not moving because that could, like that, that those other things, a heart attack and stroke. Just had an uncle that great uncle that had a stroke while he was driving you know how your stress level is when you're driving it's through the roof and if you have a high protein diet your body would trigger yourself into this stuff trigger your is trigger a stroke and you're trying to be calm and yeah your brain shuts off but your heart's racing that's how these these little sudden things happen you oh they want to they want you to move towards monitors like yo, try it out if you like it you like it but i'm saying there's a different way you can calm your body down and listen to your body instead of just ignoring these things masking it with this and that these shortcuts and not understanding how to read your body how to read your body and understanding like yo these are telltale signs this is not normal when you have extra eye crud in your eye or when you wake up in the morning you 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 you, you, you you like rushing to go to the bathroom compared to a person that wake up in the morning that yo he can stretch for five minutes then go to the bathroom mine's a little bit different i wake up i go over have to go to the bathroom 10 minutes and then i stretch then i have to poop that's how it is you know what i mean some people are different they don't poop until later just like yo usually in that first 30 minutes i already peed a whole lot and pooped and i'm like that's how I know my blood glucose is moving and going because when I was still, it was still. And now that I'm up moving, it's moving. My system is moving and it pushed everything out. And it's like, do I fill my tank up? No, let's run off this empty tank. And I noticed, oh, another poop came because I got like that energy is flowing towards the gut, not the stomach anymore. So it's really cleaning me now, really getting the kidneys flush, really getting the, the gut moving, really pulling from. Like, do you understand fatty liver disease? And the only thing that is, is your your liver is building up too much fat. And so your body got to pull the fat out of it. And your liver is just a storage area for the rest of your body to hold minerals and vitamins and proteins that you overeat with. Then if you constantly overeat, that's the fatty liver disease. And then you always have fat on your liver and you never really burn off your extra fat. That's why I wanted to go into a deep fast and be like, yo, there's fat in between my organs. I can feel it. I can't really stretch. 
my organs like I wanted to and then there's the repair phase you gotta understand when you deepen these facets you do these certain techniques so I went out to the cold air and really stretch my lungs and my chest out and really wanted that cold air to get in there to shake some things up but they they don't want you to do that and feel that and understand that they just want a bunch of monitors around your chest and your arms and your neck and your feet and I'm like yo that stuff still don't work That stuff still don't work because I had a family member hooked up to all that stuff and it still didn't save a life. It still doesn't do nothing but dry up your insurance, dry up your pockets, and then they push you on out the way because you ain't going to take care of yourself. You ain't going to change. We're just going to fuel this, this area with you, your battery. That's how some people get into this, this these metaphorics switching over with spiritual and they combine it together and you're not understanding like yo they don't want you to rely on yourself they want you to rely on them so they can fuel the system and then you can just be a part of it when he's on the other side doing what like i bet you he's doing what i'm doing he even admits cold therapy oh i don't eat meat that much i very eat little but i enjoy my steak yeah i i completely understand that but it gets to the point like yo are we what is being advertised what is being pushed you, you don't even have to need cable and TV. You can, all the books, all the stories, all the magazines and newspaper is still, is still there when you go out driving, when you go to any major city. I don't even live in a major city anymore. I live in a smaller city and it's still flooded everywhere. Meat, 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 red, meat, red, meat, red, meat, red, meat, red, meat, red. That's the number one killer. Number one killer of heart, that's the number one thing of heart disease. And I see men dropping dead of heart disease. This dude at my job thought he had COVID. Now, your heart's skipping a beat. Well, I'm about to go eat some red meat right now. Living on a ranch. Got a whole three refrigerators full of it. He didn't care. They told him to slack off the red meat. You're, you're, these levels are out of whack. Do you know why these levels are out of whack like this? Because you're high levels in red meat, bro. Well, I eat some. I eat other things. Anything that's a meal that has four legs is red meat. That's what... The, I got educated when I started doing my research. I didn't even know I thought red meat was just steak. Nope, red meat is also any mule. So lamb, all pork, all red meat. Red meat holds blood. Chicken's a different story. Birds a different story. Because when you kill a bird, you, you know, I've, I've been on farms, you let the birds drain. There's no blood in that meat. That iron hold diseases literally if you have too much iron in your blood every person that has too much iron in their blood has diseases on, on the front end and he breaks it down in his other videos but this video is very long I'm gonna have to clip up some other stuff yes you gotta understand you, your blood is your most sacred thing period 